Good morning, my name is Jack Holt, the Minister of Porth Parish Church. We are now able to gather again for Sunday services within the building, but we continue to offer this online service for those of our members who cannot attend, but also to those who have joined us over the previous weeks of lockdown and want to continue to be part of our fellowship. We hope that you will continue to be able to participate in worship through this service. We used our Harvest Thanksgiving service as an opportunity to renew our Easter candle that could not be dedicated on Easter Day. And so as you watch me light this candle that reminds us that we worship in the presence of the risen Christ, I ask you to respond to this greeting. The Lord be with you. We have gathered in God's holy presence, the one who etches grace on our hearts. This is the place where God will transform us into disciples. We glorify our God who yearns for justice, not just for a favoured few, but for the least of our world. This is the place where God will write compassion on our souls. We give thanks to God for unceasing grace. We remember God's persistence in saving us. This is the place where God will breathe the word into our lives. Let us worship God together. We sing the hymn, Jesus Stand Among Us, to the tune that I composed. Jesus stand among us in thy risen power. Let this time of worship be a hallowed hour. Breathe the Holy Spirit. Let us pray. We come before the mystery that we call God. Humanity's ingenuity may manipulate cells and smash atoms, but we are not the givers of life. For it was you that breathed into unanimated bodies and made them live. Humanity's knowledge may catalogue and formulate, but we are not the originators of reason. For it was you that gave order to the universe and laws to govern morality. Humanity's compassion may extend to close kin and kindred spirits, but we are not the source of love. For it was you that died for your enemies and forgave those that hate you. We come before the mystery that we call God, that which is beyond us above us, beneath us, before us, and yet is for us, with us, and within us, that in which we live and move and have our being, that which gives life, wisdom and love to the universe, our world, and each of us. We come before the mystery that we call God, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, before whom we bow low in reverent awe, Look up to in adoration, draw near to in ardent devotion, and welcome with open arms and hearts. Merciful God, we look back on the week just ended. 
did we exercise our faith and trust in the God who provides? Did our circle of love widen to include those living on the margins? Did our hope of eternal life withstand life's trials and pitfalls? Did we seek God's face? Did we grow to a greater maturity in Christ? Did we obey the promptings of the Spirit? Did we pray? Did we meditate? Did we serve? In silence let us each examine our Christian life and ask from God forgiveness for what we have neglected and grace to desire the blessings God has presented to us in Christ and by his Spirit. People of Polworth and beyond, listen. The God who created the cosmos, stretched out the skies, laid out the earth and all that grows from it, who breathes life into earth's people, makes them alive with his own life, says, I am God. I have called you to live right and well. I have taken responsibility for you, kept you safe. I have set you among my people to bind them to me and provided you as a light to the nations. Therefore, with diligence and perseverance, become what God has called you to be. Loving God, whose mercy comes to us new each morning, knowing these failings of ours as you do, you still invite us to share your life of grace and abundant love by being united with Jesus Christ, through the power of your Holy Spirit. We do not deserve such gifts. We can only receive them and respond because Jesus intercedes for us in our weakness. May this time of worship and our daily living proclaim our thanksgiving for these undeserved and lavish gifts of grace. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. The first reading is from the Old Testament and is contained in the book of Leviticus. The major story of the first five books of the Old Testament concerns God's choice to create from one man a nation and God's formation of this nation as his own people through their redemption from slavery in Egypt, creating a covenant with them and their wanderings in the wilderness. In the midst of that story is placed a book that was chiefly aimed at the priests of the tribe of Levi, who were to order the requirements of worship and communal life. Part of this book, however, was addressed to the whole people. It was called the Holiness Code. Its precepts were to be adhered to so that a holy God could dwell among his people by making them also holy. The Lord spoke to Moses, saying, Speak to all the congregation of the people of Israel, and say to them, You shall be holy, for I, the Lord your God, am holy. You shall not render an unjust judgment. You shall not be partial to the poor or defer to the great. With justice you shall judge your neighbour. You shall not go around as a slanderer among your people, and you shall not profit by the blood of your neighbour. I am the Lord. You shall not hate in your heart any one of your kin. You shall reprove your neighbour or you will incur guilt yourself. You shall not take vengeance or bear a grudge against any of your people, but you shall love your neighbour as yourself. I am the Lord. As pants the heart for cooling streams in parched and barren ways, so longs my soul for you. Spends the heart. 
ever cooling streams in parched and barren ways. So longs my soul for you, O oh God, and your refreshing grace. As pants the heart for cooling streams in parched and barren ways. So longs my soul for you, O oh God, and your refresh. The second reading is from the New Testament and is contained in the Gospel according to Matthew. Jesus is in Jerusalem after the events of Palm Sunday and in the temple. Jesus has used parables to unmask the truth about those who rule the nation. And now these people will retaliate and employ tactics to undermine the credibility of Jesus or force him to openly admit positions that can be used to bring about his arrest. Jesus has so far successfully dealt with a question from first the Pharisees and then from those who are called the Sadducees. But now the Pharisees return to ask a question that will determine what motivates Jesus most in his devotion to God. When that fails to elicit any damaging response, they ask another question, one they hope will finally give them the evidence they seek to denounce Jesus publicly. When the Pharisees heard that he had silenced the Sadducees, they gathered together. And one of them, a lawyer, asked him a question to test him. Teacher, which commandment in the law is the greatest? He said to him, you shall love the Lord your God with all your heart and with all your soul and with all your mind. This is the greatest and first commandment, and a second is like it. You shall love your neighbour as yourself. On these two commandments hang all the law and the prophets. Now, while the Pharisees were gathered together, Jesus asked them this question. What do you think of the Messiah? Whose son is he? They said to him, the son of David. He said to them, how is it then that David by the spirit calls him Lord, saying, the Lord said to my Lord, sit at my right, my right hand until I put your enemies under your feet. If David thus calls him Lord, how can he be his son? No one was able to give him an answer, nor from that day did anyone dare to ask him any more questions. The Word of God for the people of God. Thanks be to God. Well, good morning. Uh, a couple of years back there was a, a movie that came out and it had a, a one-word title, Arrival. Anyone who went to see it without knowing anything about it might be wondering, well, what, what does this Arrival mean? What's it all about? And they would have discovered that it was a science fiction story. It was about how an alien race comes to Earth. And by alien 
really alien. They look nothing like us. They are they are not human in form uh, in any way. And yet they've come because there is something that connects this alien race to the human race. And they discover that it is language, but it has to be looked at and discovered because their form of language, again, was nothing like any human form of language. It had to be discovered through uh, another means. But the, when, the, when the secret of their language is discovered, the humans realise that these aliens have turned up to give a gift of themselves to the human race. You see, this form of their form of language gives to humanity something it hasn't possessed before. So it's a it's a big global story inside this one word arrival. Today we are looking at a one word sermon title Holiness. And holiness it turns out is a word that can describe the big arc story of the Bible. It's about how um, the story of how God and humanity discover that there is a there is something that that links them together. God has made humanity in his image. In his image he has made them male and female. He has made them as Genesis says. And that God has come to humanity to offer something in that likeness to humanity, something of of God's self, and that something is holiness. Holiness is a word that we Scots tend not to f- feel good about. You can blame, first of all, Robert Burns, whose holy willy prayer has etched itself upon our psyche. We um, we just think of that word holy and don't see it as a good thing. Holier than thou. Oh, there's an expression that we just would hate to have thrown at us. That idea that you think you're better than us. The, the hypocrite that you are. And so we have to overcome, first of all, that whole negativity about holiness because holiness uh, runs through the entire story of scripture and finds itself expressed in our reading today from Leviticus. For there God comes to the people. This is all taking place, remember, when God has taken the people of Israel out of slavery, bondage in Egypt, brought them to Mount Sinai and there forms a covenant with them. He shall be their God, they shall be his people. And then in the midst of that, these words are said about you, you will be holy for I am holy. The experience of the people on that a mountain was not good as far as holiness was concerned either. Um, God, for the first time in Scripture, turns up in all of the might and glory and majesty of God. And what they realise is the otherness of God. How, how alien God is. How dangerous God is to them. How fatal God can be to them because God is divine, eternal, majesty. God is um, moral purity. God is life. God is all these things that, that humanity either doesn't possess in itself or is fearful of. And so we f- discover in that story that the people say to Moses, well, you know, we never want to go through that experience again. Um, you can talk to God if you like, but, you know, keep us well out of it. But then, be holy as I am holy keeps coming back because, you see, God wants to be near to the people. They might not want to be near to God, but God wants to dwell among the people. 
This is the extraordinary thing. God's desire to be with the people, with us. And so the gift of holiness is given to the people so that they will no longer need to stay distant from God. You will be holy because I am holy. I will give you the gift that you need to be able to draw near to me. But like everything else in the Old Testament, what they were given as a gift was put down externally in the form of a code. We have a highway code. Now this is is because out on the roads is a dangerous place. It's a place that can be fatal to human beings. It is a dangerous place where unless there is a lot of things put in place that can prevent accidents, that can prevent fatalities, um, we would be unsafe every time we went on the road. And so we learn and obey the highway code. The holiness code, as it's called in the book of Leviticus, had the same function in relation to being near to God. These external rules and regulations, modes of behaviour, things to do and things to avoid, were so that people could approach God and know that they would be safe. The nearness of God could be achieved that God wants. Because it became external, it was also able to be codified in a way that did the exact opposite of what it was intended to do. It created degrees of holiness and it put most people, ordinary folk, at the furthest distance from God possible. You see that most clearly in the temple of Jerusalem in the way that it was set up with its various courts There was all the provisions for cleanliness and purification. And then, if you were a Gentile, you could go into a court and no further. If you were a Jew, you could go further. But if you were a woman, you were stopped next. Then the men, they could go in a bit further. But then they too were stopped. So then, into the next area came the priests. And the priests could take a step further towards God in the performance of the rituals and rites of their sacrifices and their prayers. But then there was the place that they named the holiest of holies. This was an inner sanctum within the temple itself. And only one person could go inside there and they could only go in one day a year And they could only go in if they had been very much purified and wearing special clothing, including a breastplate upon which was written the words, Holy is the Lord. That person was the high priest. And that day was the day of atonement. And so God's intention that there would be a way in which the gift of his holiness that allowed that overcoming of his otherness so that there could be nearness between God and humanity, failed until the coming of Jesus. Because again, we have to recognise the amazing reality of what is being told in that story. God becomes a human being. God incarnate becomes part of humanity. Now the gift of holiness is going to come in a different way. It is going to come internally. And so what we discover is that in Jesus, we see what the holiness of God looks like in human form. There is still anotherness about Jesus. That's what you realise. That's what makes him distinct. That's what makes him unique. We know that he's one of us, but he's not quite 
one of us because there is something different about him and how he deals with people and what he thinks about himself and about life, how he follows God, who he goes to to befriend, who he helps, who he resists, who he calls out. All of these things set him apart and have made him stand out from the rest of humanity. And the reason is, he is the holiness of God in human form. When Jesus dies on the cross, God is at work in Christ, reconciling the world to himself. God is overcoming the barrier that has prevented the holiness that we are to have from being within us. And so what happens when Jesus dies? We're told that the great curtain in the temple, that which had hidden God away in that holy holy of holies, well, it's ripped apart. God leaves the temple, goes out into the world in the form of the spirit of the risen Christ. And that spirit comes to those that God has called to himself and resides within the Holy Spirit. We could just simply say the spirit of holiness. It's the same way of saying it. Holy Spirit, spirit of holiness, resides within us, within our being. The holiness of God that Jesus exhibits is now within us. God has achieved what he has always aimed at. You will be holy, for I am. I'm holy. Nearness to God for all of us is taken as an assumption of, well, what else could it be? But the story of Scripture says, well, it could have been very much different. This is a work of God's grace and love. That's what has achieved where we are. There is a book that has been in print since it was first published back in the 17th century. It was called the first English novel, Pilgrim's Progress, by John Bunyan, an allegory about the Christian life. There is a moment in the book where Christian is has reached the, the sepulchre, the cross, and is burdened the sins of his being that he carries on his back, It falls off his back, rolls down into the sepulchre and is gone. Now there may be those that think, well that will come at the end of the book. That's the point, isn't it? But it's not. That comes fairly early on in the book. You see, being a Christian is something in which we are meant to make progress. You see, the ultimate journey of Christian in the book is to the celestial city, to be near to God. Now I've said that God has accomplished this being near to God, but we're not there face to face with God. Our Christian journey is to be a progress towards that. The holiness that God has given us, gifted to us, It's something that we are then to put into practice, into being. It's to become part of our lives. It is to do something that continually changes us because that holiness is something that is to be grown within us. That's why in the New Testament scriptures there is talk about being babes in Christ. You're born again into Christ. But you then become a babe. And and what does uh, Paul and others say? They say you have to grow. You have to mature. You have to move on from milk to solid food. You you have to keep trying to uh, take what you've been given as a gift and make it a more and more of a reality. There's another play called Waiting for Goddard. It's a play in which two men wait for this Godat person to turn up, and he never does. And they just stand about waiting. For many Christian people, that is how they show themselves to the world. They they remain static. Their Christian lives don't bring about any 
change that can be observed either in them or by others. They just stay as they've always been. There's no growth. This is not what God intended. What God intended was that bringing you to that place where the gift could be received would be the start of something and that the rest of your life, the days on earth, are all to progress you more and more. Why? Because the final journey is on the other side of death and you have to be ready for that true nearness. We see in a dark, classly, a dark, a glass darkly, says Paul, but then we shall be face to face. And you're meant to be preparing yourself for that moment through life's journey. And so, Scripture, the New Testament, is full of these exhortations about how to live and the things that we should do. But they're not codified. It's not a holiness code anymore. It's an internal movement of our heart and mind and soul in the direction of God. And that's why in our reading from the New Testament today, Jesus is asked the question, remember, holiness of God in human form, is asked the question, what is the greatest of the commandments? And Jesus says there is this one, You shall love the Lord your God with all your heart, your soul, your mind and your strength. And then he says, oh, but there's a second one. And it's just like it. And funnily enough, it comes from the same passage that we read today in Leviticus. That code is full of things, separate things that they were to do. If you look at the code, it doesn't just... A chapter, it's a number of chapters and it's full of things. And yet the one that stood out for Jesus, you shall love your neighbour as yourself. You shall love your neighbour because he's like you. That is how holiness is now to be drawn out of us. We look for the ways in which we can love another person who is in need, who is a neighbour, who is like us. Every time we find a way to do that, we will grow in the holiness that God has gifted us through his Spirit. We will mature in the faith and trust of God, we will become ready to meet God face to face. It was God's gift to us. You will be holy because I am holy. Lord, we commit ourselves to trust you and to listen for your voice in the midst of the world's clamour for our attention. We commit ourselves to obeying your word and to seek always to live for your glory. Fill us with your spirit of holiness and empower us with your grace that we may make and keep this promise. We will give you our best, not our second best. We will give you our heart and not be half-hearted. We will give you our time, not our spare time. We will give ourselves to become your holy people. There is a tune used to sing the burn song, Scots wa hae. That tune is what we use to sing these words, Gracious Spirit, Holy Ghost. Gracious Spirit, Holy Ghost, Give my goods the poor.
Holy and eternal God, you have made of your church a holy nation, the body of Christ and the temple of your Holy Spirit. Today we pray for our brothers and sisters across the world. Pope Francis, his bishops and cardinals, as they have sought to provide solace and comfort to those in same-sex relationships. Archbishop Justin Welby and the bishops of the Anglican Communion, as they stand up for and speak out on behalf of the poor and disadvantaged and seek for their justice. The evangelical congregations across parts of the USA who have placed political gain over allegiance to Christ. And our own Church of Scotland as it seeks to restructure and reform and be renewed. In a world still struggling to contain a virus and where nations try to guard their economies, we pray for our leaders in government, in power and in opposition, national or devolved, that they may be provided with the wisdom, compassion, vision and perseverance to guide us and to work in a manner that maintains the people's trust and their unity. We pray for the scientists and their brave volunteers edging towards a viable vaccine, the staff of the NHS across the country who seek to alleviate and heal and yet who also provide palliative care and presence to the dying, and the staff of care homes who work to keep their residents not only safe but active and in good spirits. We pray for the situations across the world that shall impact how our history shall be written, for the UK and EU negotiators seeking to create a post-Brexit trading deal, the people of the USA as they vote for their next president and the shape of the Congress, the continued influx of migrants from other nations forced by war, poverty and the need for sanctuary to seek their futures on our shores, the ecological challenges of climate change, population growth and overconsumption. In our land we pray for the young people whose lives are so curtailed and their futures so uncertain and yet upon whom so many others require of them maturity and responsibility so that they may remain free from the virus themselves. We pray for the sectors of society facing the brunt of economic catastrophe through their businesses being closed and unemployment beckoning. We pray for the people who through shielding or disability or age face loneliness and isolation. The charities whose reliance on public donations have seen their funding greatly reduced. And as Remembrance Day approaches, we pray for those involved in the annual poppy appeal and admire their ingenuity and creativity in keeping their work and needs before the general public. And we pray for our circle of family and neighbours and friends, whose circumstances we know well, whose joys and whose sorrows we have shared with laughter and tears. And here as as we continue to pray in the words that Jesus taught us. Our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as in heaven. Give us today our daily bread. Forgive us our sins as we forgive those who sin against us. Save us from the time of trial and deliver us from evil. For the kingdom the power and the glory are yours now and forever. Amen. We're going to sing what will be for many a very familiar hymn, Come Down, O Love Divine. But to ensure that this is not a hymn that ends up having its tune uh, fall under copyright 
a con in infringement, I have once again composed a another version to sing today. Come down, O oh love divine. Come down, O oh love divine. Seek out the soul. Our worship is ended. Depart in peace. Lord God, we ask for your blessing so that as we go back into our daily living, we remain committed to you in faith, sustained by hope and enabled to live in love. The Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face to shine upon you and be gracious to you. The Lord lift up his countenance upon you and grant you to know his peace. And all the people replied, Amen. As ever, we thank everyone who has joined this online service today and become part of our worshipping community here at Polworth Parish Church. Next Sunday, the 1st of November, is what the church remembers as All Saints Day. And I'll be asking the congregation uh, that meets in Polworth this same question that I'm going to put to you. That is, who is the saint of history? 
or in contemporary life that you have most admired. Uh, sort of homework for the week is to have a think about who, who, who is the saint who you would say has had some impression upon you in terms of their writings or their life uh, as you have uh, journeyed on your uh, Christian life. And I ask you to bring your thoughts on that to next week's service as part of our prayers. Until then, keep safe. <laughs>